in Ephesians chapter 1. We continue our, our studies through the book of Ephesians. And we can, I was talking with Pastor Goldworthy about it and Dr. Lewis. You could sort of just take yourself as a preacher, teacher, park yourself in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and spend a decade if you wanted to. It's just such a loaded portion of Scripture. Now, this particular subject, I couldn't effectively teach um, expositionally through the book of Ephesians like we're, we just started last week without covering at least this subject once. And I covered it. I teach on it a lot, or I mention it a lot. I covered it 581 days ago. I counted. I went back and looked. So I thought that'd be fun. How long ago did I teach on this? It was 581 days ago. So you, you might remember, and I was able to resurrect some of that message. So I was able to actually um, recreate some of the things we did for that particular service and then resurrect some of the things we did for that um, particular service. So you can, um, if you want to remember this, um, great. If you don't, um, better. Um, if you th- say you understand it, you're lying. <laughs> because this is way beyond comprehension. And what I have written in my notes here is vitally important that we understand um, what the biblical idea of meditation is. Um, sometimes we think meditation is we're sitting like a locust and something like that. And that's, that, that's not, that, and that's meditation to some point, I guess. Um, that's emptying our mind into a, a um, blank nirvana, which something else can fill up our brain with. Met, biblical meditation is very focused. It's on the Word of God, and it's, um, and it's actually the Hebrew word for meditation means mutter. Anyone ever talk to themselves? Who, who, who do you, if you talk to yourself more than you talk to other people? Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, that's probably the case because you understand yourself better. And then you have, have to counsel yourself and do all these type of things. So I get it. Um, and that's what sort of biblical um, meditation is. We mutter. We take the verses. We think through things. We pray over things. We ask God to reveal us things through the Holy Spirit because we need the Holy Spirit to show us. Um, and, and then, and then he, the Holy Spirit reveals things at a deeper level, peels back one more peel, a banana peel, and that whole banana peel never gets peeled until we go to heaven. Then we, act, we, fa- we actually wrap our arms around what redemption is. But right now, um, eye has not seen, near, near has ear heard what God has prepared for those that love him. Talking about the gospel, um, unto him who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ever ask or think in Ephesians 3.20. We'll see that probably a couple months. That's talking about the gospel. That isn't talking about winning the lottery. It's talking about the gospel. It goes way beyond anything we could ever think. So, so this becomes our meditation, and God begins to teach us, and we think, and we stop ourselves thinking this way. No, this is truth. I've shared this, I mean, I've been preaching a long time, so I share the same stories, I'm sure, repetitively as they pop into my head. But, um, but I, I remember many times waking up one morning, particularly, this was in the last 10 years, feeling guilty. And I'm thinking, why am I feeling guilty? Did I do something wrong? Did I get mad at the football game? Well, that's potentially, but I repented. And, um, and, and stuff, and, and I go back down this whole list of things which I could have potentially been guilty for, and none of them applied. So I'm thinking, you know, I think I'm just guilty because I think I probably deserve to be guilty for something. <laughs> and I said, does Christ want me guilty? No, actually, he took my guilt. And I was able to actually see myself thinking in this negative, unredemptive cycle and change the way that I thought. So I want to, I want to as we dive into this message and you embrace the truth we're, gonna, we're going to um, share this morning, I'm going to pray that the Spirit of God reveals it to you and the Spirit of God reveals it to me um, on a practical level. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful message. It's loaded with... Um, unknowable content, but the Spirit needs to reveal it to us how this applies in my thought life, how this applies in how I relate to my past, how I relate to sin and weaknesses in my life, how I relate to my spouse and relationships. The Spirit needs to show us how to do that. When I pray for my wife in the morning, and I pray for my my wife every day, and and, uh, my kids every day, um, and 
maybe I'm, I could be a little frustrated or something, not that that ever happens um, or anything like that. And, um, and then God always shows me things. He speaks to me through the Spirit. Um, the problem is it's never about her. It's always about me, which just gets irritating after a while. But, it, it, it's, um, but the point is the Spirit of God teaches you that. He never shows me things about other people in outside of maybe their woundedness and, and, and the things they have to battle with and gives me a different perspective on them. But he will show me things about me, and then I can help, through the Holy Spirit's help, fix them. So two of the biggest issues or problems that Christians face, questions, let me put it that way, um, who, we are in, who we are in Christ and who God is. Do we know who God is? Really, I mean, I'm not looking for the Sunday school theological answer. And do we know when he died on the cross and says it is finished, what really happened for us? What does that, what impact does that make on our life? Outside of just saying I was forgiven. Yeah, you were. But it's such more, so much more profound than that. There is a positional impact and then there is an experiential impact. Sometimes we can wrap our heads around the positional impact, but I think the purpose of meditation is to take the positional impact of truth and bring it down into an experiential impact of truth. Truth was never meant just to be admired. It was meant to be applied. And that's what I, my prayer for all of us um, this morning. Um, back in the um, 1800s, there's this, you know, Charles Spurgeon, ever heard of Charles Spurgeon? Big, big old preacher, um, Metropolitan Tabernacle. I went to his church when I went to England and looked at it. took a bomb in World War II, but it's still a place. There's still a thriving ministry in, um, the, in that um, part of town, beautiful frontage to the church. He, when he died, he was replaced by a guy named A.T. Pearson. Some of you may have heard his name. A.T. Pearson was actually a big name back then. He was the consulting editor for the Schofield Reference Bible. He is a personal friend of D.L. Moody, George Mueller, Adrian Jun um, Gordon, Judson Gordon, a missionary. Um, and he's written, he preached over 13,000 sermons. I preached about 6,000, so it gives you how many this guy preached. And, um, and wrote about 50 books and um, preached all over the world. Back then, he didn't preach on the internet. <laughs> when you preached to crowds, you had to go find the crowd. There was no TV coverage. There wasn't any of these things. You got on a boat, traveled for a week and a half across the ocean, and did an American tour, and there was no social media promoting it or anything. It was, it was a process attached to it. This is what he says. He wrote a book, a little one, a while ago, called In Christ Jesus. And um, I bought it a long time ago. Um, this is a quote from that book. I have a couple quotes from that book. But the most superlative of human language falls infinitely short of his divine worth, before whose indescribable glory cherubim and seraphim can only bow, veiling their face and covering their feet. The nearer we come to the very throne which um, such majesty sits, the more we are awed into silence. The more we know of him, the less we seem to know. Isn't that so true? And the more, and for the more, the boundless and limitless appears what remains to be known. In other words, he's saying, the more closer we get to God, the more awe that we fall into. Now, um, 130 times in the New Testament, I think it's 80, over 80 times in the book of Ephesians alone, you'll find these words in Christ Jesus or in Christ or similar variations. They're all pointing to the same thing depending on the particular titles Paul uses and the author uses. And when you read that in the English, it's just like we have all things in Christ. And you, and you read that and it's nice. It's, it's, um, but my English will just go, bloop, just go right over that, um, discount what it says. But when you read it in the original language, it explodes. It, it goes, it enters the realm of the incomprehensible. It, it, it's the foundation of the cross. It's the foundation of the resurrection. It's the foundation of the ascension. It's everything Jesus Christ accomplished for us in three words, in a nutshell. In Christ Jesus. 
um, we're bound by human language. And it's uh, my, my granddaughter is hearing impaired. And she's um, really needs to sign, learn how to sign. I don't really know how to sign well. My wife's better at it than I do. And I, and I know as we spend a lot of time together with her, she's a sweet, wonderful girl. You've all met her. She's been on the stage before and signed for us. She's, um, it's hard to, in order for me to get, have her understand something, my wife does this much better than I do, you have to describe it in a way that, in a language she understands. And sign language is not English. It, it's a language that is very, very much difficult. Um, under, it's very simple. And you have, I don't want to say any more because you might know a lot more about it than I do. But it's, um, for her, for me to explain a simple thing to her, it's much more complicated for me to explain it to somebody else because the only language she understands is in sign. And that's almost, I would say, speaking in sound bites. It's almost a little bit like that. It's interesting. Now, here's another Pearson quote. A very small key may open a very complex lock and a very large door. So all we have is words here. He does a great job trying to describe it. And that door may itself lead into a vast building with priceless stores of wealth and beauty. This brief phrase, in Christ Jesus, is what he's talking about. A preposition followed by a proper name is the key to the entire New Testament. These three short words, in Christ Jesus, are without a doubt the most important ever written, even by inspired pen, to express the mutual relationship of the believer in Christ. When in the word of God, a phrase like this occurs so often and with such manifold applications, it cannot be by accident. There is a deep design. God's spirit is, is bringing a truth of highest importance before us, repeating for the sake of emphasis, compelling even the careless reader to give heed as to some vital teaching. I couldn't have said any better. That's why I let him say it. <laughs> Most people say things better than me. That's why I, I have a lot of quotes. Now, with that said, let's read the first 14 um, verses of Ephesians here. And, um, and we'll, be, you know, we'll be sitting here for a while, I mean, over the next few weeks. So we're not going to really go through these exegetically today. I'm going to sp- focus on those three words. But I want to put you in into the middle of this Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus in our faithful look at that in Christ Jesus reads quick doesn't it sort of like blow right over it but there's those words grace to you and peace from the Lord the God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ we covered these verses last week Um, blessed be God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, this starts the longest sentence, verse 3. This is a sentence right through verse 14, longest sentence in the Bible. Even as he chose us in him, okay, same thing, same meaning, before the foundation of the world, that we should be home, holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. That's a, another phrase that points to the same thing. In him. See, we read this so simply, but this is saying so much more than just what we're reading in the English. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth in him, We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance 
until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory, period. So you saw it right there in him. You saw it repetitively through the... Um, through that passage, you'll see it a lot as we read through the book of Ephesians together in the next six, six to eight months, however long it takes us. Now, here's my illustration. You might remember this. I upgraded it, and I resurrected some of it. Okay, I want to introduce you to a few things. First of all, this first person you know, at least I hope you do, and if you don't, I expect you to know him before you leave. All right, there's Jesus. Okay, if you don't know him, stick around after. I get it. Now, here's somebody else you might remember. I found him, resurrected him, changed his name a little bit. Timbo Slice. I added the last name. Timbo wasn't enough, so I put Timbo Slice. And there he is. He's handsome, happy. Notice the glasses, not wearing mine right today. I, no, no teeth, so that's good. Um, Timbo Slice. Now, this is Timbo. Now, Timbo's great. I put him in my car. I put him in a seatbelt next to me driving down the road. Gets all sorts of crazy looks. <laughs> um, here's, um, here's, here's Tim's life. Now, this is Tim by himself. And, and I have a lot of things here that, that, that I have like negativity, lying, racism, slander, Yankee fan, <laughs> stuff like that. Strife, freak out, doubt, gossip, accuser, selfishness. Now, I couldn't come up with enough sins for myself. I had to borrow some of yours. So, so, so I, started filling, I, started, I started taking other people's sins, and they were volunteering them to me and stuff like that. Some of them I wrote in the back. I won't show you them. <laughs> um, foolishness, judging, fornication, slander, fear, stress. That's a sin. Anything short of faith is sin, right? Well, it could be, well. All right, no faith. Lust, deceit, stealing, pornography. Ooh, that's a bad one. No one laughed. Steelers fans. <laughs> sorry, Donna, I'm sorry. I, that was there before you came in. I didn't take that back. Um, jealousy, insecurity, meekness, um, back. Backbiting, I had to go, I said biting, what does I mean by biting? Backbiting, violence, immorality, murder, complaining, drunkenness, adultery, impurity, and God knows what else I, I skipped up there. But you get the picture, Timbo's a mess. And you could add nothing on the back, because you're not going to see the back, but you could, you, could, you could add a bunch more stuff to him and maybe add some of your stuff on there. I'm not ashamed to be Timbo because I know you could put your own name up there with a bow after I enter it, and, and you would have just as much of a messed up guy as we have. And this is who I am without Christ. Now, it was good because before I met Christ, and before, when I first met Christ, I thought there was only like three or four of these things. And then once I got over them, I was good. I, I, I didn't need any more help after that. And then the word of God started showing me things about me, and I realized, my God, I don't have these, these outward sins I need to deal with. I have all this inward corruption in my heart that God needs to weed out and root out of me. I said, how long is that going to take? Is that going to take another six months? <laughs> Here I am, 30-something years later, and it's still being rooted out of me. Some of these things aren't as big as they used to be. Some of them aren't issues at all. Some of them are still going strong. And there's a bunch on here I haven't even found out yet. So this is Timbo. Now, this is the problem. This is Jesus. And he's absolutely, perfectly white and holy and righteous, missing nothing. There's nothing amiss in him, absolutely acceptable to God. And I put Timbo up to Jesus. He sort of sticks out like a sore, th sore thumb, doesn't he? Timbo is, is all nothing but messed up. He's nothing but corrupt. And compared to the, the, compared to the purity and the beauty of Jesus Christ, he, he doesn't have a hope because God says that nobody can go to heaven and nobody can have fellowship with him unless they're absolutely perfect. Perfect. Unless they're absolutely righteous. All the time, unless they have never sinned from the moment they were born, only those people 
could ever be in the presence of God and inhabit heaven. So we're beginning to like wean down the list a little bit, could go. So when I was three and I stole my brother's cookie, that was it. Lost forever. Because I'm being facetious. But the picture was, if there was one man that was righteous, or one man that could have been righteous, Jesus never would have came and died on a cross. If man had the potential of gaining eternal life and living by eternal life by themselves in their own strength, Jesus never would have came and died on the cross. He goes, nope, they have the capability of doing it. I will judge them on their works. I will judge them on their fruit if they had the ability. But he knew from the Garden of Eden till now that we didn't. And this is who we are. We may be refined we may be grotesque. In other words, we may be just out there, billboard sinners, Christian sinners, refined sinners, sophisticated sinners, unsophisticated sinners, loud sinners, quiet sinners, secret sinners, public sinners. But we're sinners. And one sin is falling short on the glory of God. So when we read these verses... And it says that we have been placed in Christ. I think you know what I'm going to do here. I got some duct tape. Notice it's red for the blood of Christ. That was a, I was looking for actually Red Sox duct tape. I left it at home. So this is the best I could do. So I couldn't trash talk this morning in my message. So anyway, we take Tim. And I've changed this um, um, illustration numerous times through the years. I used to use a little envelope. But as I've grown, I've, my illustration's grown. I'm going to take Tim, place him in the box. Close the box. Hopefully. Take my red blood blood of Christ blood tape. Not blood tape, duct tape. This is my 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 pool um my whole toolkit right here at home. Now, where's Timbo? He's in Christ. Can you tell me some of the sins he did again? I like to remember them. Well, just name some of your own. You'll get them right. <laughs> Here's Timbo. This is so when man looks at me now, and I could be a total idiot. This is what they see, Jesus. They don't see me. When God looks at me and we stand before God on the judgment seat, what does he see? Jesus, because Jesus was the only truly righteous one. He was the only one that nothing was written on his, in his life but perfection. He was absolutely holy. So I, God sees me. He doesn't judge me. Jesus was died on the cross. He was judged for my sins. And so now, when I get born again and I'm saved, I'm placed in Christ. And that's what God sees now. His son's personal, holy, pure righteousness and perfections. And I'm inside. And it's, you know what? It's sealed with his blood. This is my theology. You might disagree with me. But I believe there's no opening this puppy, okay? And if I was, and this is what's cool, and I couldn't figure out a way to illustrate this. If I was to turn this box upside down, you don't hear Timbo moving in there, do you? No. That's because I'm crafty. <laughs> Timbo wasn't moving because he became part of the box. His life is he is part of Christ's life now. He's just not like he's, and this is an illustration, he's just not in a box covered by Christ. He becomes a partaker of divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 3. So he becomes part of the very life of Christ, um, um, enjoying the very righteousness of Christ and enjoying the holiness of Christ while on planet Earth, struggling with the things that we struggle for, 
battling with the things we battle with, failing in the things that we fail with, things in my mind, things with my body. God, God looks at me and says, no, you're, you're in me. Boy, as we wrap our heads around this, or try to anyway, I don't get it. I'm trying to get it. I think about it. I study it. I illustrate it. I reflect on it. Say, God, I, I want to understand. When I die, my first breath in heaven, I'm going to look, be going up to heaven, and I'm going to go, whoa, I get it now. I get exactly how dark Timbo was and how many other things were written on him and how I understand how pure Jesus was and what true holiness really is and the real reason why I could be put in this box and sealed, grace. Something I could never earn or ne I could never, ever um, achieve on myself. So Timbo Slice is gone. Who's left? Jesus. Because Timbo Slice has been placed in Christ. What does this mean? I'm going to go quickly through this. This means that our entire, what time do I have here? Oh, I have time. Our entire identity has become in Christ. We are surrounded by Christ. That's my point. And we are. Again, these are words, not doing it justice. All the writing on Timbo has been absorbed into Christ. And this is, here's another, another part B to that. Even the things that I could boast in. Paul said in Philippians 3, I could boast more than anyone, but all my righteousness is lost. It's dung, he says. So I could, even my boasts, my accomplishments, maybe my religiosity, my moral victories that I acquired through just really conforming of my own willpower, my successes in life, my, my um, spiritual resume, I've been doing this for so long, serve God so much. My spiritual resume, that's in Christ too. Jesus remembers it all, don't get me wrong. Hebrews 6.10, but that's all in Christ too. So that, those successes don't become my identity because if they do, then I become self-righteous. The, 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 the defeat, sin, victim, Bad decisions doesn't become my identity. Nope. The only thing that I really, I, this is my identity. Right here. Jesus Christ. But some of the things on Timbo, I can't read it anymore. When I look at myself and I say who God is and, and who are we in Christ, this is who we are in Christ. We're in Christ. It means we're separated to him. We are protected from all outside forces. I can't get at Timbo. I mean, obviously, I could with my super sharp little knife I have, Swiss Army knife. But I'm sealed. This is sealed, and it's sealed with his blood. So I, I, he's, I'm, I'm separated from the world. The world doesn't have anything I need. I don't need the world's approval. I don't need the world's acceptance. I'm in Christ. The devil can look um, at that and say, hey, what about those things on Tim? No, some of those things on Timbo, he, he had been a Christian for 15 years, and some of those things were still on Timbo. What about those things? What things, devil? Accuser of the brethren, lie from the very beginning. What things? I don't see anything. I see Jesus. Those things are gone. That personal weakness is gone. That repetitive sin is gone. Is that, are they real in our life? Yeah. Can they impact our life? Yes. Can they, bad decisions change the course of our life? Yes. But can sin and failure change, change our placement in Christ? No. We're placed in Christ. Say, so, you know, Pastor, I don't know. That's a little extreme. If you can show me where I'm wrong in this, please. I've looked at this every which way. I've studied this inside and out for a long time. This is the truth. I've been placed in, in Christ Jesus. 
The devil has lost all authority in my life. I have this word I made up here. And we have lost all accusability. It's a little line underneath the word. It's like, I know it. It's not a real word. It, um, it's, I can't be accused anymore. Because all my accusations, I, my, my response is I'm hidden in Christ. Is that an a, a, um, excuse to get out of, no? If I did something, I should fix it. If I can't fix it, need to fix it. Doesn't, but it's changed how Christ thinks of me. Being separated in him hopefully means I embrace the things he embraces. That I value the things his, he values. His mission becomes my mission. But that's not a requirement. Next thing he does is he mounts centennial over any harm. Including us trying to harm ourselves. Let me read these verses in Romans. These are some of my favorite passages right here. This might be my favorite passage in, the, in Romans. My favorite passage for sure right now. It'll change tomorrow, but for today it's my favorite passage. <laughs> Do you know, verse 3, all, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Look at that. For if we have been united with him, in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in resurrection like his. Now, the word united is this great, great Greek word called symphutos, and it's, it means from the same life source. I forget the commentator, but they says a picture of Siamese twins. Siamese twins are, have the same life source. They share the same organs. That's what happened when we're placed in Christ. We have the same life source. We both have, we have, we have the eternal life. Eternal life isn't just a length of life. It's a life that starts the moment the Holy, the Holy Spirit seals us. And once I'm sealed with the Spirit, which we'll see a few verses later, verse 13, and later on in the book in Ephesians 4.30, I'm forever sealed into the life of Christ. The life of Christ, his source as a source, is always mine. That's redemption. And this is the gospel, and this is, this is why I turned the world upside down. When Paul wrote these things to the, the Greek mind, they right wrapped their heads around it a little bit more than most of us do in our English, and the gospel's been sort of rerun for 2,000 years now. But when they took this truth out into the world and compared it to, to um, the philosophies of the day and the religions of the day, it was a mushroom cloud in people's head. That's how come the world's turned upside down. Because this gospel is so gr grand and so glorious. Again, I can tip the box over, but Timbo's secure in there. I have tape on his back. <laughs> so we're protected from the devil. We're protected from the world. And here's a big one. I'm protected from myself. Because I think I had the biggest, I'm, a, I'm my own biggest enemy. I can't get at myself. I can't take myself out of Christ. I'm sealed there till the day of redemption, the scripture says. Now we looked at, Dave picked this out um, on the program. I just give him the theme. He picked this out this, this morning, the footprints. You've all seen the footprint on the sands thing. We've all had that. We bought them at thrift stores for 99 cents. And um, and they have that's and that's a and that's um that's beautiful and it does when there's only one footprint Jesus is carrying you, but I just want to look at that in the light of this morning's message. Um, there's one set of footprints here. When I become in Christ, can Timbo walk again? No, Christ can. But there's there's always one set of footprints. That's my point. There's never separation from us and him. Even if I think I'm walking along. Even if I look at God and say, na 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 boo boo, I don't want you to walk with me. Okay? I, I, it's, he walks with me because I'm placed in him. And when he seals me with his spirit, I say, okay, I don't want to walk with you in this area. He goes, huh, sorry. You're in me now. You're adopted into my family. I can't change that. That's an eternal fact that took place when you said yes to me. Now, can I live like 
Hades? Yeah, I can. Can I do bad things still? Mm -hmm. Do I walk in the spirit, per se? No, I wouldn't know if I'd use it that term that way, but I walk in Christ. And I can walk in the spirit anytime I want. So we always walk in Christ whether I act like it or not. And this is the thing. In my life, I, more times I'm more not. <laughs> I do have short, I do have a lack of faith sometimes. I do worry. I do stress out. I do get angry. I still become a victim. I still do all these things that are human in my life. And then I see what I do and I fix it and I act like that again. I think like that and I fix it and I do it again and I fix it with God. I say fix it with man if I have to. So I keep fixing it, but yeah, I still do those things. I'm still very human. But God doesn't have me on a yo-yo. Well, Tim's up. Tim's got a good day. He's up. Ooh, ooh, there he goes again. Ooh, he's up again. Ooh, he's down again. No, that'd be my day. It'd be like this all the time. If I, if I compared myself to perfect righteousness, I don't. I just keep looking to what he did on that cross. And that gives me my answer. The last thing you do, we have this supply. We've been talking about this sort of, and I'll be done. He supplies us. He runs Centennial. I, I, so far, he's, um, he separated us, surrounded us. Next thing you know, he supplies us. And this becomes this organic union we have with Christ. It's living. That's why I, took, I chose the word organic. The power, the supply of power, internal healing, forgiveness, restoration, the source of joy, contentment. I have a, I have a new internal life now. Eternal life, yeah, but I'm not talking about right now, right here, a internal life. And the more this becomes part of my internal thought process, the more internal life I'm going to be free in. The more joy, the more peace, the more strength, the more ability to say no to things I need to say no at. Let's look at these verses and we'll, we'll wrap it up really soon. In it, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness to the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So look at He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You think that's talking about um, rent money or prosperity or just an internal life? By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, watch this, so that through them these precious and very great promises, you can become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. So I become, through these promises, the promises of being in Christ, the promises of forgiveness, the promises of restoration, the promises of rebound, I can, I can be partakers of his divine nature. The moment I'm placed in Christ, Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him, those two words again, the fullness, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That's talking about Jesus. That's a credible verse. You think of that. In him, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus Christ was the fullness of deity. Verse 10. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So Jesus is a fullness of deity, dwells bodily, and, but, and I have been filled with what? The fullness of deity in Christ. It's not realized now experientially in many ways in my life, but that's where I stand. And as I, I reflect and I meditate and I rehearse and I teach myself to think like this, the more experiential, this positional grand truth, this positional diamond that we've been given becomes more realized in my life. All the circuitry we need to prosper internally is plugged in. Believe it? Believe it. But I don't feel it. You don't have to feel anything. It's truth. You just believe it. If I waited for my feelings to catch up with my beliefs, I'd be waiting a long time. No, we don't feel, wait for feeling anything. 
Truth is truth. I walk in truth with or without feelings. We are in Christ. So I confess it to myself. I meditate on it. I thank God for it. And I think about it today and tomorrow. I look at other people and I filter other people through it. So I look at them differently than I do now. And the more that I keep this dwelling on my inside, the more it's going to start impacting my internal life. And as it impacts my internal life, it will impact my external life. I'm not talking about eternal life. That's established in here. But the external life. Let me quote with this, uh, end with this quote by, oops, just lost it, by Boer. It's a great book that he wrote. Um, to love ourselves correctly is, see, is to see ourselves as God sees us and to allow the word, not the world, to define us by telling us who, who and whose we really are. The clearer that we capture the vision of our new identity in Christ, the more we will realize that our deepest needs for security, significance, and satisfaction are met in Him and not in people, possessions, or positions. Grasping our true and unlimited resources in Christ frees us from bondage to the opinions of others and gives us the liberty to love and serve others regardless of their response. Isn't that how it works? He did all the work. And this plugged us into his own life. Jesus, thank you for these words and thank you for these truths. Truly, God, beyond our comprehension. Just beyond our comprehension, God. But we thank you for it. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your shed blood. Thank you for loving us unconditionally when we're all together unlovable. Thank you for bringing us into your family and adopting us as your children. We are so grateful. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, we'd like to give you that opportunity to be placed in Christ. See, Timbo was out here, and that was his life before he met Christ. Now, in my life, um, I was 19 years old, and I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I was a senior in high school, and I was sealed with the Spirit to the day of redemption that day. And it hasn't changed since. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, in the quiet place of your heart, just between you and God. In your own way, your own words, just say something. No prayer, just say, God, I didn't understand a bunch of stuff, but today I ask you to be my Savior. I ask you to pay for my sins and place me in your Son, Jesus Christ. You said that prayer and you meant it for God in your own way, your own words. Just let the person that brought you here know after church. We'd like to rejoice with you and pray with you. Father, teach us, teach me this message. Teach me this message better tomorrow than I know it today. Teach me this message when I'm frustrated tomorrow or later on today, when I'm angry, when I'm condemned, when I'm lonely. I beat myself up. Teach me this message. Uh, teach me this message when I look at all my bad decisions that I made in my life. How I relate to myself. Father, teach me this message when I look at my inconsistent emotions sometimes. And my woundedness, which I, sometimes I just can't seem to get over. Help me accept grace for the fact that I'm human and I'm wounded. Bless this message to our hearts and bless the offering we're about to share now. God, we give it to you because we love you, because of your mercy, because of your grace. In Jesus' name.